Please explain how you ended up linking up with Coxon, right? And singing with the Clarendorians at such a young age. I just don't understand that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the whole Studio One thing started with Ernest Wilson, Peter Austin, who were already members of the Clarendonians. They had gone to Kingston and had made it big time with some bad tunes. Shubi Dubi, Rude Boy, Ghana Jail, You Can't Be Happy, What a Bam Bam. So it was excitement in our community to have brothers from our hometown doing well in Kingston. It was like a parish finals kind of thing back then in the days. You know, where whatever parish an artist came from and was doing well, that parish would be rooting for the artist. So Clarendonians had great rooting from Clarendon and across the country, basically, but because they were Clarendonians, you know, all Clarendon root for the Clarendonians. And so my mom, her name is Miss Steining, God bless her soul, and Ernest's mom, Ernest's mom, her name is Miss Etlin. And um, she worked at Veer Technical High School, which is one of our prominent high schools in out of Clarendon. And um, she got paid every, every other Thursday. My mom is a housewife. She's a kindergarten um, teacher. She taught most of my friends um, and all the kids in the community that en end up going to high school and college. She pretty much taught them as a teacher. And when Miss Etlin reached out to her and told her that Ernest and Peter was going to Kingston next week and they were not leaving Freddie. Because by this time, I used to go to Ernest's house to watch them rehearse because we both live minutes from each other. So, you know, while being there, because Ernest and I, we used to sing at East Primary School. Every Thursday, there was a, a acoustic piano and Ernest used to bang away on the piano and we sing. So, by, by this time, people kind of realized that a tiny son, like a Freddie, and Ernest, them can sing, them sing every Thursday at school and vibes are grown in my community. So I made up a little song called Roll Dumpling Roll. If you want to know dumpling sweet, dip it in a coconut oil. Because dumpling is kind of a staple for us in that community, you know. Um, in here's Clarence and where we're from, there's no farming community per se. It's all about sugar cane and that kind of thing. And my stepfather worked in the sugar cane industry and most people there work in the sugar cane industry. Where I was born, however, in Upper Clarendon is where they farm real food. But we had moved from Upper Clarendon um, since I was very young. Can I ask you something? Sorry to cut the argument. Mm -hmm. Hearing that your mother was a teacher and your stepfather was a, a worker. He worked in the sugar cane industry. Do you think that influenced your work ethic in your life? Oh, yeah, most certainly. Because I had to watch my stepfather get up at 4 a.m. every morning. My mind at the kitchen, I fried dumpling and prepare food for him to carry, you know, we had a, um, back then there was a three tier, what we call a, it, it's like a thermos, you would call it, but it has three compartments. So one would have the food, one would have the, the, the fish or the salt fish, and the other one would have the vegetable and... <laughs> so, yeah, that's how we grew up and um, I just went there with Ernest and Pete and watched them rehearsing until eventually I start dabbling and start trying to hold the harmony and stuff. And usually you know, as, a, as a youth, if you spoil up people's stuff, they're going to really blast you. you know? But that was the case. So apparently I was doing okay. And so it went on and on until it was confirmed that we were leaving Sunday. And um, that Sunday morning, the bus terminus is a bus called Clarendon Comet. I remember that very clearly. And the bus terminus was about two miles from where we live. So like 5 a.m. in the morning when, when the driver blew that horn, it is to remind the community that the bus is ready to go. So whoever was going to Mapen or Spanish Town or wherever else, you would know that it's time to go to the main road to catch that bus. So my sister and mom, they made a thermos of tea for me. And um, my mom put some newspaper in my chest. At the time, I never knew, knew what that was for. Um, I le later learned that, um, what's it called? When you travel long distances as a child, you usually get motion sickness. And I, I found out later that the newspaper was to avoid you from getting that motion sickness. And my sister gave me a nutmeg and I kept it in my mouth as well. So that was part of controlling the motion sickness. And um, then I got my change and stuff to buy ice cream and peanut and all the things that 
little seven-year-old would want on his way to Kingston. But at that time, going to Kingston was like going to New York. You know, you, when you leave in the country, you go into Kingston, it's, it's a big thing. Because when people was going away to foreign countries in the early days, people used to go to the airport and literally cry. You know, when you're waving people goodbye, it's a bag of crying and all of that stuff. I mean, you miss your loved one and you're not sure when you're going to see them again kind of thing. But, you know, going to Kingston was the same feeling. And um, I never knew what I was doing at the time. I, I, I couldn't, at seven years old, I don't think I could have known what I was doing or getting into. But Ernest and Peter was my guide. Because when the bus, when I boarded the bus, it was just coming from the terminal. So I had options in terms of seating. And when you're traveling long distances, you want a window seat. Because as a kid, you want to see everything that you could possibly see. When we, when we got to the main square in Hayes, Ernest and Peter boarded right there. And Ernest's mommy settling, she took them. She came with them. And the last instruction was, Ernest, when you see the cemetery, because we never understood cemetery at the time. We would have said cemetery, country talk. And she said, when you see the cemetery, you're downtown. I asked the driver to put you up on a Patipan bus, which was a Jolly Joseph bus, but there was a particular one, a number 13 bus that was shorter, and they called it Patipan bus for some reason. But that's the bus that would go to Brentford Road. And those were the instructions she laid out. And her final word was, Ernest, whatever you do, take care of tiny son. My mom is Miss Tiny. And she said, Ernest, whatever you do, take care of Miss Tiny son, because we were going to a place called Kingston. And at, uh, during those days in, King, in Kingston, there was gangster lifestyle, but it wasn't anything near what it is today. Rude boy, yeah, rude boy. It's Spangle and, you know, man button up them shirt neck and Gregory Isaac still had that style. Open him shirt front and, you know, Clark's boot and it was that kind of thing. Ratchet knife at the time. It wasn't go about guns so much. It was ratchet knife. You know, everybody had their knives and clerk's boots and arrow shirt and you spang up the neck and you have your, your, your cap with it because strap around it and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we went into Kingston at a, I would say a volatile time in 1963, but it was cool and calm. Politics never reason. No, but, well, politics was on, but it wasn't anything like it is today. But, I mean, totally far different. Um, so, yes, um, the bus driver left us at the corner of Elgin Road and Brentford Road, which was about a black walk to the studio, because we could see the sign, Jamaica Recording Studio. So when we got off the bus and was walking up to the studio, I mean, for me, everything was strange. For Ernest and Peter, they already knew what was going on. Well, let me hear you say, my auntie, my 